1 John chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. So again, as we turn to the Bible, we do today continue in, in our readings in the first letter of John. And we now move on to chapter 3 and the first three verses, appropriately verse 1 through to verse 3. But we must remember the context here, um, which reminds us that John has just said that antichrists have gone out into the world and we live as Christians in a time when our faith will be opposed. Now this is not a new thing. John was saying this and he was probably writing this about 70 AD. So, um, you know, that is a long time ago. Um, time moves along. And until Jesus returns, and we do not know when that will be, then we must deal with difficulties. So having spread out an issue that is a problem, then our writer wants to point out to us that despite the problems, we should feel secure. And this is very important in our society today. There are all kinds of things that individually and as a community we will be worried about. But God is saying to us that overarching all of these things like an umbrella is the thing that keeps us safe, that we belong to him. Many, many years ago, there was a young man whose parents were part of a trapeze act in a circus. And um, one day, doing their normal performance in the evening, the parents fell from the trapeze where they would perform without a safety net and they fell to their death. And the young boy who was then left an orphan was traumatized by this, understandably. But a gentleman came and stood by his side and said, don't worry, it will be all right. And he arranged to have that young boy adopted, which was a difficult thing, particularly then, because um, this man was not a married man, he was a single man. And usually in a home, the wife is seen as the backbone of society. But they persuaded the authorities, and so it went ahead. Now fortunately, this man who was adopting the young boy was a millionaire 
and um, his name was Bruce Wayne. And the boy, Dick Grayson, became his faithful companion. Unbeknownst to most, Bruce Wayne spent his nights as Batman, and Dick Grayson became Robin, his faithful associate. And this has passed into the annals of folklore. Some people don't believe that story. I know it to be true. But this subject of adoption, which in that context you might think is fictional, is something that happens in the real world. And adoption for some people is a good experience. For some people, not so good. And I'm not going to get into the rights and wrongs of that, because that's not what our sermon is about today. Because it is not about adoption services or adoption through the council or the social services. It is about adoption by God, which if we are Christians, we have all been adopted by God. And this is a very important point. Say so some people have bad fathers, some people have good fathers, some people have bad adopted fathers, some people have good adopted fathers. The one thing that this passage seeks to assure us of is that we have been adopted by God and God is a good adoptive father. Says in our first verse, see what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. You know, that word, lavish. I want you to think of your favorite food and think of maybe a sandwich. You know, um, having a sandwich in New York, having a sandwich in New York City, in New York State, is quite an experience. Here... Um, if you have a sandwich in your local cafe, the amount of content that you get is roughly the same as one of the pieces of bread. That doesn't count as lavish. If you have a sandwich in New York City or New York State, the bread is hardly an issue. I was once in New York State in a place called Cooperstown, and in Cooperstown there is not a lot other than places where you can eat. And a guy who was an American guy sat near me, uh, ordered a burger. And when the waitress brought it, he said, wow, that looks wonderful. How do I eat it? Because there was a bread bun on top, half a bread bun on the bottom, and this much of burger and filling. Now that is lavish, you know? When I was last in New York, which is sadly now a few years ago because of everything that's happening in society, became my... Um, practice at the end of my working day to have a Reuben sandwich and I went to my favorite delicatessen that stayed open until I have no idea when they closed because I used to get my sandwich at about three in the morning and um, again a little bit of bread lots of meat 
supposed to get a pickle or a gherkin on it. Oh, you know, I'd never make a vegetarian. Just put a little bit more meat on there for me. So, lavish. And that is the nature of the love of God. Imagine your favorite thing and God has lavished it on you in the nature of his love. This is what I try to explain to people who are struggling. And none of us are immune to that. Um, you know, I've noted in the past that whether we are Christian or not Christian, the only one of us who goes through life with a smile on their face every day, every hour, is a moron or a simpleton. Because life is really not like that. Life is a hard place to be. Work is hard. Family can be hard. But it is easier because we walk through it with the love of God <coughs> alongside us. And that love of God is not just a little bit. It is lavish. It's like, for example, if you're going through a really tough place. You know, it's like sometimes, I don't know if you've ever been on one of those roller coasters where you know you go up and down and you have a little bit of something to hold you in place if life is a roller coaster as some pop singer once told us many years ago then the big thing that keeps us in place is the love of god and it is deep, and it is real. It doesn't take away the pain, but it protects us. And if we pretend to others in the community that it takes away the pain, then really we have nothing that we can share with them that's of any value. Because they need to know that we share the common ground. Love is there for us. We need to be thankful that it is there. And it is not just a little bit of love. It's not an English sandwich. It's a New York sandwich. Now, something that people get confused about in this, and I get asked about, so let's get this one out of the way. They get confused about the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, but he is also God. Now, I don't have to try and explain that one to you today, maybe another day, but they also get confused about the fact that Jesus is the only son of God and we are children of God. Now, the important distinction here is that Jesus has been the son of God before the worlds began, always. Before time immemorial, as they say, whatever that means. And we are more recent additions to the family. We are adopted. We are not gods. We are people who belong to God. We are in the family. You know? Somebody sent me a message on the... Um, computer these days um, you know you get a lot of messages that way and he said 
I mean no disrespect, brother. Now, first of all, as soon as you read those words, you know that somebody is going to disrespect you. Let's not have no fooling around here. But the word brother is meant to be there to soften the blow. And we can use that in Christian circles in a realistic way or in a false way. We are all brothers and sisters if we are the adopted children of God. And that is wonderful. And therefore, we must accept that God has our best interest at heart. We might think, well, I'm going through this tough time. Why would God let this happen? I was talking the other day to someone. I was saying to them, you know, we need to think through those questions before the tough time comes. Or if the tough time comes and we're not prepared for it, we're going to think God has abandoned us. And there's no indication in the Bible anywhere that the Christian life will be sweetness and happiness and joy. You know? You might remember that guy in the Bible. Um, it's always, it's, it, it confuses me because one minute he's Simon and the next minute he's Peter. Uh, but you remember this guy, you know, commended by Jesus. Jesus says to him, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Such a positive thing to say about somebody. All we can do is get into a fight with other churches about what it really means. Uh, it's wonderful. But... It's the same guy who Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. And then a little bit later on, he says to him, you know, when you were young, you went where you wanted to go. But when you are old, someone will take you by your hands and lead you where you do not want to go. And just in case we haven't got the idea of how harsh a thing it, this is, um, this, we're then told, is an indication of the way that Peter was going to die. You know, you could have left the phrase hanging in the air and you might think, oh, it's about when he's old and maybe he's in nursing care or something like that, and he's got a nice carer looking after him and leading him into the shower, even though he doesn't particularly want to shower at the moment. No, this is an indication of the way he was going to die, and straight away we know that these people are soldiers and they are going to kill this hero of the scripture. Now, if they were going to kill the hero of the scripture. Why do we think that our lives are going to be sweetness and light and joy? If you see a preacher or a Christian who is smiling all the time, worry about whether they are fools or they are trying to fool you. It will usually be one or the other. But the reason that it is better to be adopted children of God rather than to be on our own is because God has given us hope. It says that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he truly is. 
Now again, I want to say here that that doesn't mean that we will become God. We will become a perfect human being after all of our struggles when Christ comes. I was talking earlier in the service about my time when I was pastor of the church in Greenford. And in the church in Greenford, they had a crash room for small children who uh, couldn't be in Sunday school because they weren't old enough to learn things. So we locked them away. Uh, and it had a sign on the door which I thought was very clever because it was based on scripture and it said uh, not all will sleep but we will all be changed <laughs> now in its meaning on the crash door this meant that the babies would still be rowdy but they would have their nappy changed anyway in its meaning in scripture, it means that those of us who might not die before Christ returns will also be changed into the person we will be when Christ comes. And this is an interesting point of view when we get into thinking about ideas that have come up in some churches about purgatory and things like that. A place where there is neither heaven nor hell, where we have to work off our sins. The reality is that when Christ returns, we will be made like him. And so we have this hope. And I want to say that hope, like faith, and so many other things in the Christian life, are based on the facts that we know. You know, sometimes you hear people talking about stepping out in faith, or taking a move of blind faith. Faith that is blind is no faith at all. If God gives us reason to do something and then we do it, that is based on faith. But it is based on the things that God has told us. Paul says in another letter that if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then we are most to be pitied because people like Paul had given up the whole of their way of life in order to be a preacher who had spread the word of Jesus which meant that they went to prison for their trouble. Now in that way, if they had no proof that this was true, then their faith would be blind. But Paul was persuaded it was true because on the road to Damascus, Jesus appeared to him. The other apostles were persuaded that it was true that because for 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus came to them and met them. Evidence. And this is why I say again and again that we must be readers of scripture. We are gatherers of evidence. Not gatherers of evidence to just to persuade others, but gatherers of evidence 
to persuade ourselves. Because either personally or as a church or as a community, there will be tough times. And you will need the evidence to keep you faithful during the tough times. So then we have this hope. And John says that the final step in this chain is that all who have this hope purify themselves. Now we often think that it is God's work to purify us. And that is true. But also we are partners in this. You know, um, over Christmas, I was reading a short story. I don't know if you've ever come across it. Um, it's called A Christmas Carol. And it's about two uh, guys who ran a counting house. I've never really been able to figure out what the man Scrooge actually did for a living. Uh, in every film you see of the book, he has a slightly different profession, but in the book it actually never tells you other than he hoards money. Um, and two gentlemen who are collecting for charity um, say to him, have we the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? And Mr. Marley has been dead seven years this very night, Mr. Scrooge says. But the sign on the door still says, Scrooge and Marley. And we are in a partnership. You're in a partnership with each other. You are in a partnership with God. But also you are responsible for yourself. God is responsible for you and he will not give up on you. We are somewhat silly if when we are struggling we don't get in touch with somebody and say, look, I'm struggling. You know, used to be an excuse when maybe you lived in on a farm and you lived two miles from the next farm and you couldn't get in touch with the guy who lived on the next farm because there was snow piled up all over the place. But you know now, I don't know if you've noticed these things. I don't know where they came from. We have these things called phones. They're everywhere. I can't get away from them. You think, oh, you know, it's one o'clock in the morning. And, you know, my phone beeps. I never turn my phone off just in case anybody's in trouble. Um, but sometimes somebody wants, to, they desperately at one o'clock in the morning, they need to send me a little clip of a film of a cat on YouTube or something like that. Um, but if you're in trouble, Call somebody, call me, call the person that you feel you can trust in church. Don't sweat it out on yourself. But, you know, if you can't call, there's, you know, I don't know what this is, email. And then every couple of years we have these new, you know, social media things. I can't keep up. But loads and loads of ways to try and communicate. And we're not getting any better at communicating. And we have this thing. I think it must also be a new thing that, um, because lots of people, they don't do it. So it must be a new thing. Um, but it's called prayer. And it's the way in which the junior partner in the partnership 
can get in touch with the senior partner in the partnership and yell help. And some of us are not so good at that either. So, and one of the things we're meant to do through this business of working with our partner is to see our lives purified. To strip our lives of the tendency to sin, the tendency to do wrong, and to be in a situation where more and more as the days go by, we do right. You know, um, I know Jill, for example, has lots and lots of those big gold bars at home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, before she can um, put them in her vault where she stores them, she likes to heat them up in her furnace to strip out all the impurities and make them 24 carat. <laughs> and, um, you know, it is that kind of thing. When Jesus comes, we will be changed. But here and now, we are meant to be being changed. And we have a role to play in that. It is based upon our hope. It is based on the fact that we have been adopted as children of God. <laughs>